Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this seminar of the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies here at the George Washington uh, University. We will be today discussing uh, the what is happening in Belarus, but trying to take a longer view and, and, and look in a more kind of comprehensive way at the, the trajectory of Belarus in these last few years, because the country is more and more uh, visible in the on the general media landscape, which means that things are a lot of things are kind of uh, uh, happening and tensions are kind of growing around around it. And for that, we have three really great speakers that I will be very briefly presenting. But you can read more details on their bios on our website. We have Arkady Moshe, who is program director for the EU Eastern Neighborhood and Russia Research Program and a member of PONAS. Uh, our uh, Ponas Eurasia Network at the uh, George Washington uh, University here, but is um, uh, sorry, I'm, I lost this. <laughs> uh, um, he was an, an associate fellows of the Russian Eurasia program at Chatham House and is uh, uh, now uh, based in uh, Helsinki. Then we will have Natalia Chernyshova, who is senior lecturer in modern history at the University of Winchester in the uh, um, uh, UK, and then Dr. Yulia Brel Fournier, who is an assistant policy scientist at the Center for Applied Demography and Survey Research at the University of Delaware. I will give each of them uh, uh, the floor for about 10 minutes, and then we will open uh, for a broad discussion, and we will be looking at both the, the current migrant crisis, the, 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 the protests and their, their legacy, and more globally, the kind of cultural and identity uh, uh, situation of, of uh, Belarus. So once again, once again, welcome, and Arkady, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marlene. And let me start by thanking the Elliott School, the GW, for arranging this event. I've been a scholar of Belarus for basically almost 30 years, and it's always nice, even when the reason is like now, it's always nice to see that the country that you study actually attracts attention. I was specifically asked by the organizers to concentrate on the current migrant crisis. I'm not sure how much new thing, how much new I can say in my introductory words, but at least I will probably try to maybe repackage and emphasize some of the things that you know about differently. And my first point is that what we call a migrant crisis is actually not a crisis. Because when you look at the numbers, you will see that this is a very minor event which does not deserve the attention that it has attracted. Uh, we don't know how many illegal migrants, econo illegal economic migrants mostly, uh, have been able to cross the Belarusian Polish border or are in Belarus now. The range of figures that we see is probably from three, 4,000 to maybe 10, 15,000. There uh, there's German statistics that at least starting from spring this year, a little bit less than 11,000 people have been able to get to Germany allegedly through Poland and Belarusian Polish border. But how accurate that is, I can't know. But whatever the numbers are, they are minuscule. Let me just give you an idea. Greece is the country, the population, with the population the, the size of Belarus, uh, received 40,000 asylum applications last year, and in previous years had been receiving up to 80,000 asylum seeker applications per year. Italy is receiving about 80, 90,000 uh, illegal economic migrants every year. All in all, in recent years, which are calm by European standards, Europe have been receiving about half a million people. So if you put the 10, 15,000, which have been going through Belarus into this picture, you will see that this is a really, really minor thing. Then why do we think it's a crisis? And why do we, why do we call it a crisis? There are of course secondary things, which I don't have time to go through, like the Polish politics, and, the, and, Paul and Warsaw's relations with Brussels uh, and the media attention and, they can, and the media that can get there, unlike many places in the Mediterranean where it cannot get. But the most important thing which really needs to be taken into account, it is that it's totally unacceptable, inadmissible, 
and worrying if a state is allowed to become a trafficker. Because it's one story when you're dealing with mafias of all sorts and human traffickers who arrange things illegally. And it's a totally different story if a state which has a pretty powerful, which pretty powerful security services uh, and, and, and kind of possibility uh, to have plane loads of people flying in to the country basically as frequently as it will be required gets involved. So that's why it is a really big problem which needs to be addressed and taken into account in full. Uh, so in that case, despite the numbers, the situation is really amounting to a crisis. My third point, which you probably know well, and that's why I will not spend too much attention on that, is about the calculus on the Belarusian side. Because I belong to that school which believes that this crisis is of Minsk's making. It's not of Russia's making. I mean, Russia uses and manipulates it to its, to its own benefit, but it was invented and arranged by Minsk and through Minsk using the opportunities and resources that it had. Uh, and the major component of this calculus is that, of course, Minsk wanted to get attention. It wanted to be recognized. Mr. Lukashenko wanted to be viewed as a leader with whom the West will talk about. And for that reason, uh, it seemed worth it to Minsk arranging a crisis. Uh, and we should say that the war reasons in Minsk to believe that that calculus might work and might bear fruit. Why? Because especially the European Union, but partly the United States, for years have been creating this impression that they are actually weak. And if you press them hard, they will make concessions. And the last year, we probably will be talking about that again and more during this, this, this event, uh, was yet another example. What was the Western reaction to uh, the repressions uh, in Belarus? Practically zero. Three first packages of sanctions which were uh, adopted before November last year were even taken, if taken together, weaker than the sanctions adopted in 2011, for example, although the level of repressions now was much higher. Lukashenko himself was not under sanctions until November. So the, the interpretation in Minsk was that sooner or later the, the West would get tired and would start negotiations. You just need to threaten, to intimidate it, to show it that you can create a problem big enough. Uh, I will say later that this calculus didn't work, but it, it, it couldn't be known in the beginning. I also need to say about uh, the Russian factor. Where I've just said a minute ago that Russia benefited from the crisis uh, for two reasons. One was that wh whatever was going on the Belarusian-Polish border worked for Russian narrative, again, about the, the West. Because from the point of view of the Russian propaganda makers, this was a win-win situation. If the EU accepted the migrants, of course, the story would be that they are weaklings, that again, they cannot protect their borders, they cannot arrange their own security, they have to outsource this and that. If they refuse to take the migrants, the story would be that uh, they're brutal, they're inhumane, they don't really care about those, those exactly values that they so much like to be talking about. So there was a very strong PR component because the crisis on the Belarusian border was amplifying the message that had been coming from Russia about the West and the EU in particular for years. But there was a more instrumental reason, again, the calculus in Moscow was, and it, this did come true, that sooner or later, the Europeans would come to Moscow asking for help. They were coming to Moscow asking for help before, uh, amidst the, the protests, asking Moscow to talk to Lukashenko, and they were expected to come to Moscow to again ask it to talk to Lukashenko also now. And that's exactly what happened when Madame Merkel and some other European leaders called Moscow trying to get Moscow's help. 
And of course, a less important thing, but something that we still still remember, uh, even as, if, it's, if it is a small thing, it's still a drain on the Western EU resources. And whatever is a drain on, on the Western EU resources, diplomatic resources, uh, security resources, uh, works for Moscow because Moscow is involved into a zero sum game with the West. Then why the calculus didn't work? And we know that it didn't work. So instead of accepting the refugees, uh, the European diplomacy became unusually active working with the, the countries which were sources of migration, Iraq, even Syria, definitely Turkey. And they were able to convince uh, the leaders there that it was not a good idea and it would not be a good idea to keep sending this plane loads of people. And finally, they came up with the fifth package of sanctions. We still need to see how it's going to work. But this is something more serious, maybe more serious than everything that we have seen thus far. So why the calculus hasn't worked? Again, three major reasons. The reason number one is because the country Belarus was actually bordering and trying to particular blackmail in particular were Poland and Lithuania. These are not the softest countries uh, in the European Union and NATO for that matter. And these are the country which also because of their domestic politics thought that it would be easier for them to be tough, to be strong and to say, no, this is not going to happen. Our border is not as penetrable uh, as some people might think. So it's the tough reaction of the governments of the Poland and Lithuania, which was one factor why the calculus hasn't worked. Second, more generally, uh, if you live now in Europe, you realize that around, what you see around you is not 2015 anymore. That the narrative that all these people need help and they're all political refugees and they're all endangered. This narrative is embraced by the majority of the people in most of the countries that, I, that I've been studying at least, including Finland. The basic understanding is that these people are economic migrants and there's only that much that a country or European Union for that matter can do by taking them in. And that means that sooner or later, somewhere you have to draw the line. Partly it's, be it's because the more centrist and even liberal politicians need to respond uh, to more right populist narratives, but partly it's just the understanding that if the situation continues as it has been going thus far, there will be problems. And the third reason, and that's why majority of Europe at least is indeed in solidarity with Warsaw and Vilnius, rather than taking the narrative of the both either human rights uh, organization or the pro-migrant lobby, which also exists, of course, uh, and, and works and, and acts accordingly. The third and final reason here is that, interestingly enough, but that's what I think, uh, Russia does not show 100% solidarity with Belarus. This is not, again, this is not Russia's crisis in my read. That's why while Russia was able to reap the benefits it wanted to reap, it doesn't want to go all the way. It doesn't want this conflict to become too much of, a, of an element, of an immediate element of Russian Western conflict. So rather it wants to be viewed as, again, as a potential intermediary, as an actor in between. And for that reason, it didn't go all the way in support of Lukashenko. And my final point here and a conclusion is the lesson needs to lesson what lessons needs to be learned. One thing that we definitely know about Lukashenko is that he is not a good loser. That uh, we, if he fails this time, Belarus will not start negotiating a different kind of uh, more trustworthy and confidence based relationship with the West. It will probably try to invent something else to put pressure on the West. And the response to it should be tough and firm as it has been relatively tough and relatively firm in the case of the migration crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arkady. It's, it's a great summary, I think, and it's really, uh, you made so many important points. I'm sure they will come back in, in the discussion. I now would like to give the floor to Natalia. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. And um, I join uh, Marlene, um, I join Arkady in thanking the, the uh, uh, institution, Marlene, in particular, in uh, organizing this, but uh, also agree with Marlene that Arkady made very interesting comments. Now, um, as has already been indicated, the migrant crisis is only the latest stage in the acute domestic political crisis in Belarus, which began with the mass protests in August 9, uh, 2020. And I think it's important to remember these, um, and, and this is where, where I come in, as it were, with my 10 minutes presentation, because they had a transformative impact on Belarusian society and on the domestic um, you know, political dynamics in, in the country. Uh, mass protests may have stopped, um, but their impact remains and, and forms a crucial backdrop to everything that's happening in Belarus today. Um, I will not go into too many details because I think you, you, most of you are familiar with what happened, but I'll just recap some of the you know, kind of le legacies or, or lessons of, of these protests um, that are relevant uh, at, at the moment and will be relevant uh, for the future. Now, as most of you know, I'm sure the protests in, uh, in the summer and autumn of 2020 were a popular response uh, first to the electoral fraud um, and then to violence. And both stages were unprecedented for Belarus in terms of the scale of the protests and both left important legacies. And now protests around presidential elections had happened before, um, and 2010 is one example. But even before the voting took place in the presidential elections of uh, 2020, it was clear that this wasn't going to be the same uh, story, that these elections would be different. Um, for one, Lukashenko, of course, faced new opponents, um, not uh, people who were drawn from the old all too familiar, worn out opposition, but uh, someone completely new. And they were all women. Lukashenko underestimated them as political opponents. And secondly, the popular frustrations that had been bubbling um, under the surface, frustrations with the economy, with the bureaucratic system that was dysfunctional, um, all of those uh, frustrations began to really boil over over the government's uh, poor response, mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the gap that was left by the authorities in, as it were, looking after society was filled by society itself. And it became a useful training for self-organization, uh, especially using digital technology. Another area where the, the Lukashenko regime is very inept, very incompetent. Um, and so Belarusian civil society that had often been seen as undeveloped or underdeveloped suddenly burst forth in this um, healthcare crisis, took shape, was pushed to the foreground. Um, and, you know, Belarusians saw that. Um, Belarusian society got further mobilized in the pre-election uh, campaign. Um, again, digital technology played a major role here uh, with digital voting platforms, with uh, telegram channels, with blogs, social media, all being actively used by the uh, Lukashenko's opponents by Lukashenko's opponents. Now, all of those developments gave Belarusians confidence that these elections, these, the outcome of these elections might be different. And when it wasn't, the mass protests broke out. Again, already this was on a new scale for uh, Belarus. They were also different in terms of their strategy, um, uh, partly again, thanks to digital technology, which played a role. So there were a lot of differences with the previous scenarios and familiar stories. So even at this stage, several turning points were reached um, that escalated the political situation to a critical level. But what really propelled the crisis to um, the point of no return um, was the violence, the brutality with which the authorities responded to the protests. Now, of course, again, this was not the first time this, the, the, the regime used violence before against its opponents, but the scale of the cruelty, the scale was just unprecedented for independent Belarus. Um, and it was also unusually visible. Again, graphic images of um, tortured uh, protesters, um, um, recordings uh, of, of beatings in custody, uh, personal accounts of victims, that all of that stuff spread through social media like fire. It bypassed censorship, it bypassed state media. Um, and it galvanized the population, even the apolitical parts of it, to the extent that I had not seen before. And this is when we start seeing women's marches, um, uh, the huge Sunday mass rallies, 
uh, again, which were unprecedented in those in modern history. This is where the older generation comes out, the pensioners and so on. And so we see also this incessant stream of smaller scale protests like flash mobs or um, artworks and art installations, small groups marching, not necessarily enormous uh, marches. They've got a little bit less media attention, um, but they really got on the authorities' nerves um, and um, were a kind of a constant reminder of their loss of control. So this protest activity all exploded, particularly in response to violence. Now, after about six months, the authorities managed to put a stop to mass protests. Um, it's worth mentioning that some very small scale protest activity continues, but it's just been driven underground. Um, and uh, some of it harder, it is harder to, to kind of monitor and um, quantify. But the regime achieved this by pure force. So relentless repression, cruel, often senseless. Um, it's the numbers are hard to um to be precise about but about more than 35,000 people had been through detention for either on administrative charges or on criminal charges uh in fact more than 5,000 criminal cases have been opened by now and thousands of people are in jail um many of them are facing or have been given already very lengthy um terms in prison and as of today according to the human rights group Vesna, there are 909 prisoners and, and this is this counter is constantly clocking more and more uh, prisoners, political prisoners on a daily basis. Um, people continue to be tortured in detention. One example uh, of that is a businessman, of, uh, businessman by name Stepan Lapipo, who was driven by police beatings in custody to an attempt to commit suicide in the courtroom. Um, he was saved and then sentenced to eight and a half years in the penal colony. Um, another appalling case is that of uh, a minor, uh, a, a, a boy who was uh, arrested when he was 16, and he's still in jail. He was sentenced also to several years in, in jail. Uh, his name is Mik Mikita Zolotaro. He suffers from epilepsy, and he was also repeatedly beaten and tortured in prison. People are routinely arrested, they're routinely beaten, beaten in custody, sorry, uh, even women, even uh, to this day. So last month alone, for example, uh, another 143 people were detained on politically motivated charges. This is just a kind of a monthly statistics in Belgium. So re the repression is ongoing and escalating. Many more have been forced abroad. Um, we have been focusing on uh, the international migrant crisis provoked by Belarus. Um, uh, because, you know, it is acute, people are dying, uh, but also, as, as Arkady mentioned, uh, because it directly affects the EU security concerns and borders. But Belarus has had another migrant crisis, if you like, an ongoing uh, a, a crisis of emigration. In other words, people leaving Belarus. Belarus is bleeding its population. And we're talking about, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of people. Um, they had to flee their homes because they feared for their lives or for the lives of their loved ones and, and so on. So, you know, Poland recently mentioned alone 180,000 Belarusians who live in, in Poland um, now, who, who had to relocate um, out of Belarus recently. Now, for a country of only less now less than 10 million people, these are considerable losses um, that, that make, um, you know, quite a difference. Especially if we consider the fact that these are usually highly skilled um, um, specialists um, and also people who are politically more active, people who found themselves in trouble with the law in Belarus, if we can talk about the law in Belarus, precisely because um, they got actively involved in trying to bring about changes. So um, these are the kind of people that Belarus needs um, and they're leaving. Now, I'm sure a lot of it is very familiar, but my point in reminding you of all of this is, is this. Um, the experience of politicization, mass politicization of society, mass protests and relentless state violence, all that experience has changed Belarusian society and its relations with the regime forever. Um, the fact that should not be obscured by the fact that, you know, those mass protests have stopped. This does mean that society um, has become more polarized, 
uh, staying out of politics is difficult, if not impossible, and many people have been dragged into politics or pushed into it by the regime's actions, so they're being forced to choose sides. But as um, a survey done by, uh, by the Chatham House has found recently, this is not an even polarization. Um, the current regime is supported only by a minority of the population, while the majority uh, of Belarusians in Belarus do not support it. And my view is that the, the regime has irrevocably lost its legitimacy. The protests and violence have destroyed the status quo, um, and um, the regime can only maintain its power by using violence. So in, 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 in other words, you know, the Lukashenko regime has to do a lot of kind of running just to stay on, on the spot. Um, yes, this could be for a long time, uh, but it's worth remembering that state violence costs money. It's expensive, you know, the security forces, the judges, the, the, the bureaucratic system have to be paid, um, uh, prisons have to be maintained and, and so on. And Belarus is a poor country. So this is where the questions of sanctions um, uh, by the West and of the extent of Russia's willingness to keep bailing Belarus out becomes especially relevant. And incidentally, uh, the same survey by Chatham House, which was conducted in, in the summer of 2021, so before really the, the migrant crisis on the border um, hit the, the uh, hit its fullest extent, um, and, and their survey found that uh, only 10% of, um, of Belarusians support full integration with Russia at the moment. And this is in fact very little if we take a longer perspective and compare this to um, a, a, a very similar question that was asked by the an Independent Institute for Social and Economic Research in Belarus in 2008. Um, and they asked about the also you know, the joining integration with Russia uh, and in 2008, uh, almost 40% of Belarusians supported that idea, and now it's 10%. And another thing to remember that the experience um, of open protest, uh, of political engagement that Belarusians had in um, summer and autumn of 2020 was transformative. Um, for one, it brought to the fore a sense of um, shared community or peoplehood, a sense of a kind of shared civic identity, um, again, something that Belarus was long thought to be missing or to not have developed in sufficient degree. And I'm sure Yulia will say more on this um, in due course. But just to make a brief comment that, um, you know, Sunday mass rallies were one experience that sort of boosted or created the sense of community. But also it's worth remembering another key example, the emergence of the neighborhood parties and small neighborhood community, the sort of grassroots, uh, germs of, of a bigger civic identity. And this is where local communities organize these um, get togethers in communal areas, such as, you know, um, uh, apartment block courtyards and things like that, with tea, cakes, music, dancing. But also, these were events where the boundary between a party and a political event was very blurred. Um, and certainly, the authorities saw these. Um, uh, community parties, not as parties, but as political um, uh, expressions. And they came down on them like a ton of bricks with uh, a lot of force. Um, one victim of that brutal crackdown was um, Raman Bodarenko, a young artist who was beaten to death by Lukashenko's pro-government thugs. And another is uh, a more current example, I suppose, is uh, um, Volga Zalatari, mother of five, a young woman, who has just been sentenced literally last week, last Friday, to uh, four years in a, in a penal colony for organizing those very, you know, uh, parties, community parties, um, and running a, a chat. Um, and, um, and she had already been in prison by this point for eight months and was tortured and beaten in, in custody. So... Uh, Natalia, can you conclude? So we keep yes, some time. That's, sorry, <laughs> that's precisely what I was going to do. Thank you, Marlin. Um, Lukashenko's regime is marking time, um, as well as thinking. So, as well as thinking about how to hasten its removal and to, um, uh, you know, facilitate transfer of power, we should also need to think about what comes next. What support needs to be in place for Belarusian society in helping its recovery, in helping it to rebuild its political system, um, and having such a robust strategy in place would really help bring about changes as well. And so my very last point is that the balance between 
justice uh, for Belarusian people and social reconciliation will be very difficult, but I think it needs to be found. So thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia, for these great comments. And I now give the floor to Yulia. You're muted, Yulia. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit different um, side of Belarus about its national and linguistic identity. Uh, because I think uh, these factors also uh, influenced very much modern history of Belarus and its development, and uh, they also played the role in uh, protest in uh, August 2020 and the aftermath of the contested presidential election of August 2020. Uh, first, a brief history of Belarus. So it's an interesting question when the history of Belarus began. If you go to the official site of the Republic of Belarus, you'll find information that says the history of Belarus dates to the Stone Age, um, which is an interesting opinion. But there is another opinion that Belarus has a millennium of history. Uh, uh, also, um, a British scientist and Andrew Wilson in his book wrote uh, at some point that at the beginning, even at the beginning of the 19th century, and I quote, the Belarusians were not yet Belarusians. They were Northern Union Ruthenians. So people didn't identify as Belarusians at that time. But the most widely accepted conventional view on the history of Belarus is that in the ninth century, it was part of Kievan Rus. Then it was absorbed by the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And later in the second half of the 16th century, Lithuania and uh, the Kingdom of Poland created the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And the Belarusian lands were part of that uh, large policy until 1795, this third partition of Poland. After that, they were absorbed by the Russian Empire. And uh, in March of 1918, during World War I, um, Belarus was proclaimed the Belarusian People's Republic. But that um, new state existed only for 10 months. And then the Bolsheviks seized um, uh, the Belarusian People's Republic and transformed it into the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. And from 1919 until 1991, Belarus was part of the Soviet Union. In 1991, when Belarus uh, quite unexpectedly acquired its independence, uh, it, it, the majority of people in Belarus, they didn't have the desire to become independent. That desire was relatively weak in Belarus. And uh, independence came unexpectedly and people, most people didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, that independence wasn't the result of the people's fight for establishing the Belarusian national ideology. Now, several words about nation formation in Belarus. So before 1917, when the territory of modern Belarus was still part of the Russian Empire, most of its dwellers were peasants. And uh, there is uh, data, immigration data in the United States that says that immigrants who came from what is now the Republic of Belarus to the USA in the 19th century, they would, not, uh, they would identify themselves mostly as um, in terms of their village or district, or they would identify as Russians or Poles, depending on their religion, whether they were Orthodox or Catholic. Very few would identify as Belarusians, or they wouldn't identify at all because they just didn't understand the question. Um, nations, as it is now, they are imaginary communities. And in Central and Eastern Europe, it is believed that nations were created by such actors as scholars, intellectuals, writers. They believed, they promoted the idea of unifying a state based on uh, a culturally unified nations. However, it is not, it is not enough for intellectuals to want to create a nation. For this to happen, it is important that this uh, a national consciousness exists and is spread um, among ordinary people. Uh, in, in Belarus, at the beginning of the 20th century, the intelligentsia, the intellectuals, they were all uh, educated in Petersburg and Warsaw because Belarus didn't have its own universities. And these people, they believed that Belarusian um, land had been thrown between Poland and Russia for centuries. And the conflicts that happened in those two countries, uh, their political, national, religious, cultural struggles, they all affected Belarus. And those intellectuals, they were, uh, the national cultural idea was focused on social mobilization, on recognition of the Belarusian language, eradicating poverty and illiteracy, and joining uh, Europe as an independent nation. But as I have mentioned, the majority of people that, that uh, intellectuals claimed to represent were peasants, and they were mostly illiterate. 
And they didn't care much about their group identity uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So the Soviet government later stated that pre uh, Belarus pre-Soviet past was, and I quote, peasant, illiterate, and stateless. So until 1919, um, the, 19, uh, the year of 1919 was the first year in uh, uh, the history of uh, Belarus when Belarusians were officially recognized as a distinct ethnocultural entity with its own ethnocultural core and language. And this was the year when the Bolsheviks granted Belarusians their own national republic. And after the establishment of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic for about a decade between 1920 and 1930, the development of the Belarusian culture and language were actively promoted by the Soviet government. And this was the same for other um, um, republics of uh, the Soviet Union. But by the end of the 1920s and in the 1930s, this policy, which was the policy of nationalization that was introduced in the Soviet Union, it was replaced by the policy of friendship of the peoples. And that new policy um, introduced Russian culture and Russian nationalism as the base of the Soviet people's unity. And it also coincided with Stalin's repressions, which severely afflicted the new Belarusian speaking elites, as well as ordinary people. So after that new policy was introduced until 1980s, Belarus was developing as a socialist republic within the Soviet Union. And when perestroika started in the 1980s, um, it raised uh, once again the issue of the national identity and ethnic origin of Belarusians. So uh, in a newly independent Belarus, society had to reconstruct, or in case of Belarus, probably just to, uh, it had to construct uh, in, uh, its new collective identity. Uh, however, as I have mentioned, by the time of the Soviet Union disintegration, the level of national identity and mass support for nationalistic ideas in Belarus was very relatively low. Belarusian intellectuals of the end of the 20th century, they were emphasizing basically the same um, ideas as uh, their predecessors at the beginning of the 20th century, which included history and language, and they truly believed that Belarusian people were just sleeping. They, were, they needed to be awakened from their dream and remember their glorious European uh, past to become a modern European nation. And since there was this idea, and then the general passivity of society with the respect to their national identity, it created the conflict of interest. So with time, uh, uh, several identity discourses developed in Belarus. Uh, two major of them are as follows. The official one that claims that the national identity of Belarusians is based exclusively on the Soviet history and mainly on the historical memory of the Great Patriotic War. And this discourse has its own set of symbols, the red-green flag and the coat of arms, which are uh, simply uh, modifications of the uh, Soviet Belarus uh, symbols. And there is the opposition discourse uh, that constructs its model of Belarusian national identity based on the concept of the Belarusianness consistent of language, culture, and independence from Russia, and has its own set of symbols, which include the red, white, red, uh, the white, red, white flag, and the Pahonia or pursuit coat of arms, excuse me. So today it is impossible to talk about a single national Belarusian identity. And now a couple of words about the problem of linguistic identity in Belarus. So from, from the- Julia, you, you won't have a lot of time for that. So maybe just some key okay. findings. Just like, just, uh, for a minute. Um, so according to the census of two, uh, 2009, 84% of people in Belarus identified as ethnic Belarusians, but only 21% claim that they use Belarusian as their language of everyday communication. And there is this huge question, what is the Belarusian language? Because there are actually three versions of it. The first one that was uh, codified for the first time in 1918, the so-called Tarashkevitsa, uh, was based on the peasant language. But then in 1933, the uh, reform was introduced and the new type of uh, language, which was structurally closer to Russian, the so-called Narkomovka was introduced. And from that time on, it's been taught at schools in Belarus. But what is widely spread in Belarus is actually trasyanka, the so-called trasyanka, which uh, literally means a mixture of hay and straw. That's a cattle feed of low quality. And this is what most people speak. And according to some research, on average, three out of four people use trasyanka to some extent in their everyday life. Uh, so the Belarusian language, the white and red white flag, used to be associated uh, predominantly with their position and were not supported by the majority of the population. But uh, during the protest of uh, 2020, uh, Belarusians somehow 
embraced for the second, again, re, they reclaimed and embraced their pre-Soviet past, including the flag, uh, the new coat of arm, Pahonia, and also a renewed interest in the language and in the culture appeared, which didn't mean that necessarily everyone switched to the Belarusian language instantaneously. But in the words of one researcher, what emerged as a result of the protest was a peculiar hybrid that consisted of a Russian-speaking or bilingual political movement that used the flag previously associated with an ethnocultural agenda of the Belarusian Popular Front and their anti-Moscow rhetoric. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Julia. Yeah, I think the, the symbolic politics that you just mentioned at the end is really a, a fascinating one on, on how historical symbols can change, right? And, and linguistic mm -hmm. identification can be, uh, be transformed. And uh, we have, to them. yes, we have about 20 minutes for the, the discussion. So I invite you to ask question in the chat or to raise your, your hand and we will give you the, the, the floor. Um, we have a question from our colleague, uh, uh, Natasha. Natasha asking that uh, during the migrant crisis, many English language publications casually refer to Lukashenko as Putin puppets, implying that Moscow was driving or at least supporting the crisis. How would you, would to the speakers characterize the relationship between Minsk and Moscow more broadly? That's simply simple uh, puppet and master or more complicated. Arkady already mentioned that partly in his uh, presentation, but maybe it would be was kind of developing a, a, a little bit more enough. If I can add on that, that we always tend to look at the Minsk-Moscow relationship. I also would like us to look at the uh, uh, Belarus-Poland, Belarus-Lithuania relationship and how that has got transformed between the, the protest and the, um, and the migrant crisis. Uh, uh, Arkady, would you like to, to begin on that question? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you for the question. I will be quick. Uh, Lukashenko is not Putin's puppet. I mean, uh, you can probably think of a feudal type of relationship when a vassal is loyal to a suzerain, but he can still do a lot of things on his own territory, practically everything. Uh, what is clear is that without Russia's support and Putin's personal support, the regime would not have survived. It would not have survived economically before and it would not have survived during the protests because it's exactly the assistance which Russia provided and the signals that it sent to the Belarusian elite that it would stay by Lukashenko that exactly prevented the elite split and the different outcome of the revolution. Uh, but uh, Lukashenko has a lot of autonomy and he has shown throughout his almost 30 years in power how much he can manipulate Russia and how much he can play on the complexes of Russia and actually keep a lot of a lot of autonomy and a lot of freedom of maneuver more than we are ready to to admit and uh, if you uh, if you're interested to read my Poner's memo which I did like three or four months before uh, you will find out the, the details of how much Lukashenko actually received from Putin already after the revolution, when there was no possibility for him uh, to threaten Putin with another round of flirtation with the West, and how little he had to give in, in return. We don't have time, but if, if I guess we, we could continue. But my basic answer is that he's, he's not a puppet. Putin is much stronger, and if Putin wanted, there would have been no Lukashenko, obviously, but Putin doesn't know how to whom to replace him with. Thank you so much, Arkady. And Natalia or Yulia, would you like to comment on the, the relationship with Russia and also, please, the relationship with Poland? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I think I, I agree with um, um, Arkady. Uh, the, the phrase that entered my head, and I don't know if that's... Um, even even that, it's but Lukashenko is the tail that wags the dog sometimes um, with, with Russia, but perhaps it's, he's not even a tail. Um, and and um, yeah, it's an it's an interesting uh, question of of their relationship because um, I think apart from Lukashenko, Moscow probably uh, th there is also in Moscow certain concern in the Kremlin of, of not antagonizing uh, the Belarusian people too much because you know, um, 
maintaining relations by force again is costly. It's a lot cheaper with soft power, with persuasion. And that Russia had, unlike perhaps Ukraine, Russia had a certain sort of cultural and um, goodwill capital in Belarus before it began to support the, um, and the Lukashenko regime before the revolution. And it's wasting it a little bit uh, now. Um, it, it's difficult to assess the public opinion in Belarus at the moment because all um, independent opinion polling has been banned. Lukashenko's sponsored opinion polling is unreliable. Um, uh, but it seems to me that yeah, that there is a danger uh, of, of Russia wasting that political capital. Um, and the support for uh, having a uh, you know, military presence in, in, of Russia in Belarus is, is not what it might have been you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I also thought, uh, uh, in, in light partly of what Yule said about the, um, the, the legacy of the Soviet Union, which of course you know, also is an elephant in the, in the room in terms of defining relationship with Russia um, and having an impact on that relationship. Um, I think, um, you know, Yulia has given um, Yulia has given such a good kind of overview of of the interpretation of those in history over over time. Uh, but um, just one little thing that I would have liked to add to that is is the late Soviet period, which I think is uh, has left a much more complex legacy than we sometimes assume. Partly because you know the Belarusian elite were so disappointed in and not being able to revive or construct a new that ethnic national identity that's separate from the Soviet Union. And, and we sometimes rely on the rhetoric about, there's a bitter rhetoric about that. But actually I think the Soviet legacy left, uh, late Soviet legacy left some more uh, stronger foundations for national identity of some kind that we, um, we often assume. Um, and partly uh, the, strength of that legacy um, meant that the pro-European Belarus kind of identity hasn't taken uh, more deeper roots because it was competing with a different kind of legacy already there. But it's also fluid. It's not just, I don't want to say that Belarus is stuck in the Soviet past. And I think it's been a misunderstanding of that legacy. Uh, and an example of that is the war um, symbols, the war memory, uh, which has been used by the protesters now against Lukashenko. And I think that's quite extraordinary because it was a trope by the Lukashenko regime for so long, helping him to legitimize his authority, and now it's used against him. Um, and the relationship with Poland is equally um, complex, and, and there are legacies um, in history that affect that relationship. Um, but that may change with uh, Poland's um, support for Belarusian revolution uh, and for the, the you know, the, the Poland could, uh, and I think has tried to step into the shoes of Russia in that small part of the population that was disappointed by Russia's support for regime uh, of Lukashenko and Poland could have filled that vacuum. Um, how the latest crisis on the border affects that uh, ability of Poland uh, is, is something that remains to be seen, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yulia? Uh, um, I agree that Lukashenko is not Putin's puppet. Uh, one example uh, could be his not recognition of Crimea until very recently. Uh, he, he didn't officially openly recognize Crimea as part of Russia until like what last week when he mentioned something to that point. Um, but I think um, uh, with all his independence, why Russia supported him, regardless of his sometimes like creating all the you know, scandals and other difficult situation and tensions with Russia was probably because due to the fact that even uh, during the um, protest, they didn't really have this uh, geopolitical kind of um, component into them. So people were protesting against the fraudulent election, against the unspeakable violence of the riot police, but they were not, they were not protesting against Russia for Europe, something like that. And so I guess Putin does understand that in Belarus, basically they have about 9.5 million of friendly to Russia people. So you don't want to antagonize them and um, to create a situation when they become your enemies. So since Belarus and like Ukraine never kind of openly wanted to join Russia instead of being, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, Europe instead of being with Belarus. So whatever Lukashenko was doing on his own didn't really matter that much as long as he remained a loyal um, ally for Russia because Belarus basically is the only uh, ally to, of Russia to Russia's Western border. 
uh, on Russia's Western border. So um, that's why I think even though he had enough autonomy of his own uh, and um, wasn't the best um, partner, uh, Russia still would support him. Thank you. We have another question more about the, the functioning of the, the Belarusian Lukashenko group, I mean, we and, and the role of economics on that, uh, Arkady mentioned several times Russia's economic aid to, to Belarus. How can we assess who is still around Lukashenko? Do we see any kind of tension emerging between a, a member of the elites since the, 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 the protest? Because usually when we study Russia, we know very well, we can very easily identify different groups competing. We have people who specialize in studying their relationship. What do we know about the kind of the inner functioning of the regime since the, the the, the 2020 protests and the role that economics uh, uh, play play in that. Arkady, would you like to begin with some comments on the economic side? Well, uh, these are different questions, but the economic situation in, in Belarus is not that bad. I mean, it's, it's thanks to the Russian subsidies, but it's also thanks to complete inefficiency of Western sanctions. I mean, I don't remember figures by by heart but this year as compared with last year belarusian exports to europe have grown significantly we are talking dozens of percents of growth of belarusian export well partly it's because of the oil prices and the price of refined oil but it's not only the story and when we were discussing the previous question on relations with lithuania and poland you take lithuania and there's a scandal that which is going on now, which might end up with the resignation of the economics minister, I think, and definitely the foreign minister, is because the Lithuanian railways are still, I mean, this is, this is not the end of the story. The investigation goes on. It's continuing to, sh to, to ship Belarusian fertilizers to Lithuanian ports. So after 15 months of totally ruined political relationship, there was not a half a step done um, to minimize this economic component of, of the relationship. So uh, there are usual stories, uh, but it, well, let's say the, the Belarusian economy is very far from collapse. But this is not, and this is one reason why the elites uh, are still rallying around Lukashenko, the ruling elites. But there are other reasons. Uh, one is that these are not really elites. These are more of a Soviet nomenclature type of people. Many of them are hand, or most of them are handpicked by Lukashenko. He's been building his vertical of power uh, in the manner which has no comparison in, in, in today's Europe or even in the Europe of the second half of the, of the 20th century. I mean, he was planting his people who he thought would, would be loyal to him uh, all the way to the level of, of the Rayon regional leaders. Uh, so that's, that's one story, that this is, this is really a personally hand-picked vertical, pretty much. Second, the intra-elite repressions in Belarus have been uh, quite strong and have been incessant, basically. Uh, different security services, their primary function was not only to follow the people, but it was also to follow the potential rival security services. Head of his personal uh, bodyguard, I think Turin was his name, correct me if I'm wrong, a couple of years ago was sentenced to a large prison term, allegedly for having taken a bribe. In reality, we don't know, but obviously there's, there's some kind of disloyalty behind him. Um, people who were associated with these or those types of economic powerhouses, again, have been going through jails all the time in Belarus. So it's, it's this combination of nomenclature type of the administration and the fear. Um, it's, it's what makes it very unlikely that there will be an elite split uh, inside Belarus. Plus, as I said, uh, the absence of a Russia signal that Russia would potentially be willing to support those who would like to detach themselves from Lukashenko. And the fact that Mr. Babarika, uh, the strongest possible contender in the last year's presidential race, uh, so far has got the major prison sentence. That's also a signal to everybody that those of you 
who will be only considering building an alternative type of relationship will, will suffer the full scale. Thank you so much, Arkady. Uh, and Natalia, would you like to add something? Yes, um, yes, I, I agree um, that uh, Lushenko's kind of uh, uh, construction of this power of the article very much reminds me of, of the Soviet type of nomenclature and, and patronage networks that existed in the Soviet, especially late part of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, but also that there's been an, an, another factor added to the complexity of kind of detaching Lukashenko from his uh, establishment. And that is the fact that uh, much of, of his circle or, or, you know, the wider system that is built is, has now been implicated in pre rubble crimes. And um, that is another link that kind of keeps them close and keeps them loyal because they're, you know, personal safety and security depend on Lukashenko's survival. So that, that is the um, challenge that I think the, the um, uh, uh, strategy on reconciliation and justice um, has, to, has to work out. And, and that's, a, that's a real challenge. Um, but that is something that uh, needs to be done if, if um, you know, any question of elite um, migration <laughs> is, is to take place. And I remember there was, again, very difficult to gauge this sort of things uh, with certainty in Belarus right now. But I remember one of the old um, uh, experienced opinion um, uh, um, measuring institutions in Belarus, one of the oldest sociological ones, uh, was trying to study that sort of uh, 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 state of the mood within the elites recently um, in, the, in the summer, I think. And, and there were some signs that maybe there was a, a trend to begin the desertion on, on this, you know, uh, not very close circle, obviously, but further down the ranks. Um, but it's not clear whether that's happened or will happen. Because again, the, the, those secure, you know, say personal safety considerations add to the personal loyalty um, obligations and, and you know, entanglements, um, I'm afraid, yeah. Thank you. Y Yulia? Yes, so um, Lukashenko made sure from the start that he would be, as he called himself, the only politician in the country. So in, in Belarus, there are no oligarchs, no clans, no independent political parties, no independent parliament who can create their own political agenda, which would contradict what he wants. And uh, as far as the law enforcement is concerned, so he constantly reshuffles people from one position to another so that their subordinates would not uh, develop specific loyalty to their um, direct commanders. And uh, because he wanted them, other people, you know, to, to believe that he's the only leader, he's the only one who can uh, be in charge. And so when uh, the events of August 2020 happened, the elites, basically, they didn't blink, they consolidated around him and supported him. Yes, there were maybe a, like some individuals who defected, but most of them stayed, the law enforcement and other elites. So uh, until now, we probably cannot say that there is anything going on in uh, military and political elite in Belarus. They're quite consolidated when they're supporting Lukashenko. And yes, they're afraid for their own safety because they're marked in uh, what happened uh, in August 2020 and in the aftermath, and they know that. Thank you so much for these great comments. It's We are already running out of time, so I wanted to thank you all for your uh, contribution. I think that gave us really great insight into the, the situation, and I'm happy we were, be, we were able to put the, the so-called migrant crisis into a kind of broader and, and, and longer perspective, more in-depth. So thank you very much for, for your great comments. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, today. It's almost the last event of uh, uh, the semester for us. We still have one next week and then we will be uh, uh, closing for, for two weeks for the, the winter break. So I wanted to thank everybody uh, uh, for being with us today and wishing all of you uh, safe and, and uh, uh, happy holidays and hopefully meet you all uh, uh, back in January. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.